Good morning, welcome to day two of the Future of Health Summit, and thank you all for your attention and participation yesterday during day one. We've just concluded our networking breakfast around diversity, and I wanted to take a moment and just talk to you about the, the Institute's work around equality. We hold this program around the world, uh, typically talking about gender equality, but inclusion overall. And I want to take a moment and just talk about this effort as it's resonant in, I'm sure, all of your corporations as it has been for such a long time. When this effort began, say 30 years ago in earnest, the, the notion was tolerance. And those of you who were working then, you may remember going to some training around this. And when I think back on that time, I think tolerance is such an, a poor word because it necessarily confers a superiority and an inferiority, right? One, one group of people is going to tolerate another. And that morphed into diversity, and diversity uh, continued to separate people somewhat, and that didn't feel totally correct. So now we're in inclusion, and diversity and inclusion efforts are, are the norm. But I think it's important to focus on what is it that we identify and what don't we? And if we continue to define people by their otherness, it's hard to see how it weaves into a cohesive whole. Last night, for those of you who joined us at dinner on the panel, I would just note on language, when one of the panelists was talking about a story, and he said, I was talking to some African-American men. And I thought, how do we describe people? And, and if you don't use some sort of descriptive, the adjectives we use, is the supposition that we're always talking about someone who's straight, white, and male, as much of the leadership in many organizations is. In, in the healthcare space, despite extraordinary diversity in the employee population, only 3% of CEOs or women. And if you looked at the Fortune 500, we've actually taken steps backwards from where we were. So when 50% of your employees, of your clients, customers, providers are all women, it's still puzzling that so few make it to the top. So if you attune your ear to that, attune your eye to that, how people speak about difference and quell it, as you hear it, and you yourselves, as you're speaking about it, try and understand the language that you're using. If I can't bring my whole self to the workplace, how am I possibly going to maximize contributions? You, you can't. So it's important to us, and it's important to us because demonstrably, those organizations that have more diversity on their boards and in their leadership consistently deliver better financial results. So this isn't doing a favor for someone. And too often, these initiatives are resonant in the HR department as if it's a benefit, as opposed to at the front line of the business where it's an imperative. So this is critical work for the Institute. And we have launched at our global conference earlier this year the Equality Pledge, where we are going out to all these Fortune 500 organizations and requesting transparency into their data around gender. And it's interesting to see who provides it and who doesn't. And we're not in an accusatory fashion at all. We're just trying to understand the data. Just as you've heard that as a theme at this conference, how important health data is and understanding if we have access to this, we can make better decisions. And the same is true inside your organizations that if we have access to your data and understand why this is happening, we can then hopefully develop uh, something in a curative fashion. So with that, I want to introduce Sunim Rivers, who's joining us from Horizon Pharma, and uh, very appreciative that Horizon sponsored that. And Horizon, actually, the chief science officer is a woman, so I think we are making progress. I don't want to not be optimistic. We just need to be more concerted in our efforts around this. So, Sunim, would you come up? Good morning. Diversity in healthcare and the lack of it has received significant attention in recent years. In 2015, McKinsey and Company released its landmark study on the correlation between the level of diversity in corporate leadership and company performance. The report was the first to leak diverse leadership to greater financial returns. Companies in the top quartile for gender diversity were 15% more likely to have financial returns above the national industry median, while those in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity were 35% more likely. But for Horizon, diversity is much more personal than financial return. We promote not just diversity, but inclusion too, and that extends to all levels of our organization. 
To expand our diversity and inclusion efforts, Horizon formed an Inclusion Leadership Council made up of leaders across the company to champion new ideas and initiative around this important issue. In addition to the council, Horizon helped to establish three initial business resource groups or groups of employees linked to common interests that thoughtfully align our areas of focus and connect to our overall business strategy. Hispanics at Horizon, Horizon's African American Network, or HAN, and Women at Horizon allow employees to help define what diversity and inclusion means to them and how they can best make an impact both internally and externally. Our CEO, Tim Walbert, has also signed the CEO Action Pledge for Diversity and Inclusion, joining over 500 other CEOs of the world's leading organizations in the largest CEO-driven business commitment to advance diversity and inclusion in the workplace. All of these efforts are aimed at supporting one fundamental belief that we hold at Horizon, and that is, when you assemble people with distinct differences, differences in technical capabilities, professional backgrounds, personal experiences, and with differing levels of expertise, this translates into strong R&D teams, clinical trials, and strong companies that are nimble and creative in their problem solving. These are all factors that drive innovation and ultimately bring about faster cures to patients. But we can always do better and commit to doing better. As evidenced by your presence here this morning, you too are committed to making greater strides in both diversity and inclusion. But we still have a long way to go. Since McKinsey's 2015 report, the companies featured in that research have only seen a 2% increase in their gender representation on their executive teams and a 1% increase in ethnic and cultural diversity. While I may not be a statistician, I know that that's not enough. There needs to be a concerted, collaborative effort to ensure that healthcare leadership is representative of the patients we work on behalf of and serve. With that, I encourage you to attend the Women's Health Breakout Session at 10 a.m. that addresses the disparities women face in health leadership and patient care and the need for inclusion of women in clinical trials and leadership. I also encourage you to take this information presented today back to your respective organizations. Join us in making diversity the default. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be, to be back up here. I walked a little slower this time on the stage, so <laughs> I'll be OK. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Frances Collins, of course, needs no introduction. Our NIH director, um, been in that role since 2009. Uh, before that, he led the Human Genome Project. Um, and also, of course, he's discovered, and his lab has discovered, a number of very important genes from cystic fibrosis um, to Huntington's, neurofibromatosis, progeria, and genes for type 2 diabetes. Um, so people call you a gene hunter, which I think is really cool. Um, so we've been talking about... Better to be a finder than a hunter, but occasionally it works. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Maybe we should change the moniker. Um, talking about uh, inclusion, of course, let's kick it off by talking about the NIH's All of Us initiative. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. I would love to, and Meg, thank you for being the interviewer in this, because you always do a fantastic job. And thanks to the uh, whole organization of the Milken Institute for putting this remarkable couple of days together. I actually have a couple of visuals that can get popped up. So if you could put up slide number one. Uh, this is basically a summary of what this All of Us program is. And maybe click one more time uh, to, so you see the whole thing. That's it. Yeah, this has been a dream of many of us going back more than a decade. The idea that we might be able to move from one-size-fits-all approaches to health maintenance and treatment of chronic disease to an approach that actually takes account of individual differences. And because I'm the genome guy, everybody thinks, oh, he's talking about genetics. Well, I am sort of. But I'm also talking about environmental exposures and health behaviors and socioeconomic status and its effect on health, all of those things. But we haven't really had a data set that would allow us to explore that at the level that we need to if we're really going to take this all apart. That's what this program now aims to do. And supported by the Congress as part of 21st Century Cures uh, over the next 10 years, so we have real stability here. This is in the process, starting back in May, of enrolling one million or more people living in the United States, the largest cohort study NIH has ever contemplated and very specifically focused on a couple of special features. One is the people who 
get engaged in this, our participants, their partners, they're at the table, they help us figure out what kind of information do they want by being part about this, and how are they comfortable with the way the program is going. Very participatory. This whole idea of patient involvement in research is, I think, one that we ought to pay a lot of attention to. It's gotten incorporated through PCORI, now through the Patient Centers Research Foundation. It is the way we should be doing things. The other thing that's unique about the way in which this is designed is its focus on diversity. We aim to have 50% of the participants in all of us be from racial and ethnic groups that represent minority populations in the country, and that's much higher proportion than most any clinical studies have previously attempted to do in this kind of cohort. We're also reaching out to people in rural communities, people in lower socioeconomic status through the community health centers to try to really have the spectrum of what is now happening in this country across geographies, across ages. Right now we're starting out with adults 18 and over, but by next year we'll start enrolling children. This already, just since May, has resulted in signups of 115,000 people. So it is going pretty quell quickly, and we do aim to have that one million strong cohort enrolled in another two or three years. If you want to sign up, just go to uh, www.joinallofusoneword.gov, uh, and you'll see what you need to do uh, to get engaged. It's pretty straightforward. Answer some questions about your health behaviors. Go through a consent process figure out how a blood sample can be obtained so that we can do some lab measures. And ultimately, everybody in this study will have their complete genome sequenced since the cost of that is coming down quite dramatically. That's even affordable. And very importantly, this will generate a database which will be accessible to any researcher with a good idea about what can be learned from it uh, with, of course, the individual identifiers stripped off, but made possible then all kinds of interesting research things that can be done afterwards. Think of this also as a platform on which lots of other studies uh, can also be layered because you're going to have a million people who are excited about research and who are pre-consented for recontact about follow-up studies. If you, for instance, want to do a new study of an artificial pancreas for diabetes, you're going to have tens of thousands of people out of these million who have diabetes who you can approach. And enrollment, therefore, for future clinical trials should be greatly accelerated. That'll be of interest both to the private sector and the public sector. So this is pretty transformational. This is a bold effort indeed. But I think when you, we look back in 20 or 30 years, we will say this is one of the most significant enterprises that has been undertaken. And it will get us to that point of having the kind of information to go from one size fits all to individualized abilities <coughs> to help people stay healthy. Are there any exclusion criteria, something that would keep you out? <laughs> No, actually, we're trying, right now, if you're under 18, you're out, but by next year, that will change. We're trying to reach out to all groups. We're trying to figure out how can we ask people who are currently in the in prison to be able to take part in this, because we want uh, representatives from everywhere. Uh, people who are elderly, yes, we want them to. Uh, we we want to have a full representation of the country. And for those <clears throat> folks who have been underrepresented in research, what are the hurdles to reaching those people and to building trust with them? and? Um, to, to getting them excited about being involved. Yeah, we did a lot of preliminary work over the course of the last couple of years with that kind of outreach to see what works and what does not. And we hired as our engagement officer uh, for all of us, uh, Dara Richardson Heron, who's an African-American physician who was previously the CMO of the YWCA, and really tried to understand, given the history here, which is not a pretty one in terms of how minorities have viewed research Tuskegee comes up fairly quickly in those conversations. How could this be different? How could this be inclusive? I think what we learned was this idea of complete openness, of trust, of having people at the table and giving them information back about themselves. Anything they want to have that we know, they can have it too. That really helped sort of build that trust. When we did the launch on May the 6th, and we had a, uh, events in seven cities across the country, I went to the one in New York, which was at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, and it was a remarkable day of conversation of saying, let's see if we could start this over again in terms of how medical research and minority communities can get together, because those people are very interested in finding out things about them, not being left out this time, mm -hmm. but having an opportunity for medical advances to help them and their families and their community. What concerns did they bring up? What was the 
the fears well, or the... Of course, concerns about discrimination. Uh, would this information somehow get used against people? We fortunately have the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, that prevents that uh, in terms of health coverage and employment, but there's still other aspects of discrimination one can worry about, like disability insurance or life insurance. Privacy, confidentiality, wait a minute, what about this database? Who's gonna have access? How secure is it? Lots of questions about how are we designing this? It's encrypted end to end, but nobody could say at this point that every database that's well designed is gonna be immune from a potential hack, so we have to be honest about that. Very important questions, questions that need answers, but ultimately everybody kind of making a decision about the benefit versus the risk of taking part. And interestingly, we now get about 50% of people who are approached to say, yeah, I wanna take part. And that seems to be true of all groups. It's not specific to those that have had more experience with research. Everybody wants to hear about it. It's about 50%. Hmm. And of that 115,000, is, is it pretty diverse? We have 49% uh, of the 115,000 that are from racial and ethnic minorities. We're like one percentage point short. We're gonna push that to 50. <laughs> and we also have lots of participation from people who have signed up through community health centers who would normally not be approached about research. Hmm. And whole genome sequencing, um, giving that to a million people. <clears throat> I know also that Geisinger, and I saw the Dr. Feinberg in the audience here in the front row yesterday, Geisinger is doing that for all of its members as well. How much utility is there on an individual basis right now to having your whole genome sequenced? You know, right now, for the individual, it may not provide a lot of immediate actionable information, although for about 2 or 3% of people who have a genome sequence, you're going to find something that is immediately actionable, and we're prepared now uh, for people who sign up. Uh, to provide that kind of information about what they need to do, some risks that you would want to do something about. But as time goes on, clearly this information will become more useful for medical purposes, particularly one can point to this whole area of pharmacogenomics, where we know that variations in the genome are predictive about whether a particular drug is going to be beneficial or maybe toxic for the individual. We haven't been using that information because when the doctor wants to write the prescription, the DNA result's not there. But if it is there already, if it's in the medical record and can be quickly queried, we should be able to optimize outcomes from drug prescribing in the next few years. And this will be a wonderful pilot effort to see how that works. How easy will it be for people who are participating in all of us to take the information they're getting back from being in the program and take it into their doctor's office? <laughs> Well, that will be a challenge, and that's another part of this pilot effort that we're going to watch closely, is how does this feed into medical practice, and how does it help medical professionals begin to incorporate this information into their recommendations. A lot of the people who are signing up uh, for all of us are doing so through their health provider organizations, because we're funding 10 of those HPOs to serve as our partners to reach out uh, to the patients they take care of to say, are you interested in taking part? That's gonna be an interesting way, I think, to do this kind of incorporation of the information into medical practice because the docs in those HPOs are gonna be engaged in this research enterprise and will therefore kind of be on the front lines of how to take that information and improve the care of their own patients. But spreading that across the whole country to every provider this is a big challenge. This is always a big challenge, isn't it? The, the delay time between when you know something is going to be medically beneficial and when it becomes standard of care is way too long in this country, and we need to work on shortening that. All of us provides us an opportunity to try out some ideas. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned 20 to 30 years. We're going to look back on this as an important, <laughs> a very important initiative. Um, is that timeline uh, guided by how long it's taken the Human Genome Project to really manifest into... Uh, real developments? Um, it is going to take some time. I don't know that it's uh, tied to the same sort of 15-year timetable that the Genome Project had to adopt. That had a different reason, mostly because Jim Watson made the number up of being 15 years. Uh, for all of us, though, it is a cohort study. And these kinds of studies get better and better and better as the years go by. You have more and more information because these people were asking to take part. They're taking part potentially for life, and they're going to keep feeding back new information about themselves, about their medical experiences. We're going to ask them to walk around with wearable sensors that keep track of what's happening. So the database in the first year or two is going to be really interesting, but 10 years from now, it's going to be fantastic, and 20 years, even better. Like Framingham, the study that started in 1948, 
where a lot of the real insights didn't happen in 1949. They happened the late 50s to 60s to 70s and are still happening. This kind of study builds over time. And how easy is it to opt out if you decide you don't want to be part of it anymore? Um, it is absolutely part of this, and that is uh, the way we've put it together. If you decided to take part and at some point downstream you say, mm, not for me, I'm tired of all those emails asking me about my health behavior, you can definitely opt out. Obviously, we're hoping not too many people will because we want to have a million people. We're aiming to try to enroll more than that, recognizing that there will be some people who decide to drop out along the way, but we want to keep that to a small number. Mm. Well, I have to move on because I've already used up so much of our time, but it's so interesting. <laughs> it's not the only thing you're doing. The Brain Initiative is another important uh, yes. uh, project. Yeah, put up slide three, if you would. This is an initiative started three and a half years ago, which aims to do something truly ambitious, which is to figure out how those 86 billion neurons between your ears do what they do. And the complexity here is pretty daunting because each one of those neurons has about a thousand connections. So we're talking about the most complicated structure in the known universe. And you have one of those right here. Incredibly efficient in its use of energy and its ability to carry out complex uh, manipulations and operations. But we don't know how it works. You know, we have means now with imaging to look at the whole brain when somebody is thinking about something or carrying out an activity using PET scans and fMRIs. And we certainly can look at individual neurons and try to say, what are they doing? But there's this big area in between of circuits composed of hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons that are doing something really interesting, like laying down a memory or retrieving it or uh, carrying out a particular motor activity or interpreting some visual information. That's the part we want to try to get a handle on. And so NIH, working with multiple other partners, both in this country and, and internationally, have engaged now in this 10-year effort, again supported through 21st Century Cures, to try to get answers to how those circuits work in real time. Uh, Josh Gordon, who's here, is going to be talking in the next panel, along with Walter Koroshetz at NIH, are co-leading this effort for us. And we are three and a half years into a 10-year program, and I think it's fair to say further along than we thought we would be. Most of what we're investing is, is technology development, to be able to do that kind of assessment in real time of what's happening. The second half of this is going to move more and more towards understanding applications. We're in the process right now of coming up with a new plan for the second half. The original plan, which was really quite well thought through and very much embraced uh, by those who read it carefully, is already looking like it was maybe a little underambitious, and we can go even faster and further in the next five years of this than we had thought. So this is going to provide a foundation of how the brain works. It's a basic science effort, but that foundation is going to be incredibly powerful for applications such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, autism, Goodness, drug addiction, which was much of the topic of yesterday, we need to understand what happens to the brain in the presence of drugs and how we could come up with even more effective ways to help those people who've fallen into addiction. And without that information yet, so much of these diseases are, are just mysteries. So you think about Alzheimer's disease and the drug development work that's going on there, not even really understanding what's driving the disease. Um, how would you characterize the work that NIH is supporting uh, into Alzheimer's drug development a lot of people have criticized the field for sticking to the amyloid hypothesis for so long um, and saying it's sort of this echo chamber. Uh, what, what's your take on the amyloid hypothesis and what drives Alzheimer's and, and where NIH is putting its dollars? Well, it's a topic of intense interest. <clears throat> and again, Congress has more than tripled our budget for Alzheimer's disease over the course of the last five years, and we're putting that to good use. Yes, amyloid is clearly a major player, and we do know that there are families where there's a mutation in the gene for amyloid, and they get Alzheimer's disease, so if you want a genetic proof that it's important. But it doesn't seem to be the whole story. Proteins like tau are also critically important, and there's probably other things that are druggable that could uh, deserve more attention, and we're putting that attention there now. One of the things I'm personally engaged in is a public-private partnership with industry called AMP, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, and Alzheimer's is one of the major areas of focus. For that purpose, we actually are doing a systems biology approach to understanding what's different between a brain that has Alzheimer's disease versus one that does not. And out of that has come already the identification of dozens of potential, potential additional drug targets that ha have not previously been recognized that industry is pretty excited about. 
So it does have to be all hands on deck. This is such an incredible challenge to our country. It's costing already $300 billion a year and headed for a trillion if we don't come up with an answer. I am guardedly optimistic that we're starting to see some progress there, but this is a really, really hard problem. Let nobody imagine that it's just going to take one bright idea to push this over the finish line. How do you observe the, um, the funding patterns changing in NIH? A lot of the, you hear young investigators saying, oh, it's so hard when you're unproven. Um, a lot of the big grants go to the, the proven uh, professors and people who've been working in this field for a long time. How's that changing or is it changing? It's an area of intense focus at NIH. We are concerned that the slippage in funding for biomedical research that happened between 2003 and 2015 a 12-year period where we lost more than 20% of our uh, budget uh, uh, purchasing power, really put a very tough amount of strain, particularly on early stage investigators, just trying to get started and having trouble getting the grant funded and their lab off the ground. So now, thankfully, the Congress having, for the last four years, turned a corner on that, and we've seen steady increases now 30% over where we were four years ago. Thank you, U.S. Congress. It has made it possible uh, to put particular emphasis now on those early stage investigators. We tried last year in FY18 uh, to really make this the highest priority across all 27 institutes, and we held ourselves accountable to funding at least 1,100 of those early stage investigators who'd never previously been a, a PI on an NIH grant, uh, and we pushed really hard, and I'm glad to say we funded 1,208. So that's the largest number ever. And I hope anybody who's listening to this who's concerned about the trajectory for the future for young investigators would be encouraged to see how this focus is really making things brighter than they were for a number of years. But still, we're still in a challenging circumstance. We still can't fund more than about one out of four of those and more like one out of five of other applications, which means a lot of great science is still on the table, uh, not getting funded, uh, left there uh, for maybe another attempt but maybe people are giving up. So it's wonderful to have this strong support from the Congress. We need to keep that going. Obviously, the country that leads in biomedical research is probably going to lead economically in the whole world. Uh, the United States has had that role for many years, but we can't be confident of sustaining it, given particularly the strong efforts happening in China. This is a really important area uh, for our country to invest in. Mm. We're just about out of time, but I want to ask you, you know, we're in an area, an, an era of time in medicine when um, it really feels like science fiction in some ways when you think about CRISPR, gene editing, gene therapy, uh, some of the new technologies that have been coming out in medicine. What are you most excited about that you see really coming to people right now? Boy, it is a long list. I'd have to mention cancer immunotherapy because of the remarkable advances that have been happening, uh, which are now recognized by the Nobel Prize. Uh, which means that people with metastatic cancers, for whom we usually said we have really no opportunity here uh, for anything other than perhaps a remission, if that, now we are seeing cures for things that we previously thought were unimaginable by activating the immune system. I would have to mention what we're be able to do now with gene therapy and gene editing after many years of frustration. This is going to be the first year where we have patients with sickle cell disease that are in clinical trials using gene therapy or gene editing strategies that promise not just to give you a benefit, but to give you a cure. I think we will cure sickle cell disease in the next five years. That is an amazing thing to be able to say to all of you. I wouldn't have had the courage to say that until quite recently. All of those things coming forward, building things like new vaccines for HIV AIDS, a universal flu vaccine entirely within reach now. Uh, all of the things that are happening uh, with neuro, uh, neurological conditions, we talked about Alzheimer's, but progress in schizophrenia and autism also because of our ability to understand the brain. Uh, it's a very long list. It is the most exciting time right now to be engaged in biomedical research uh, in the history of the universe. And so to have a chance for me uh, to continue to serve uh, as the NIH leader is just a wonderful privilege. Well, Dr. Collins, thank you very much. Thank you all.